when I think about the things that we should be staying up late at night about, worrying about, uh, these are the four things. Now, there's many things going on in our world we should be excited about and very positive about, but these are the big issues, in my opinion. And the last one on this list, the healthcare crisis derived from our aging population worldwide, I think is a bigger problem than most people realize. If we look at, um, if we look at the demographics, and in this case, demographics, it's not a matter of theory, it's just a matter of math and addition. The US population has almost doubled since the 1960s. And while this happened, the proportion of youngsters that can be caregivers has decreased. So we're very top heavy. And if we just look further downstream to the year 2020, 2025, it's easy to see that with an aging population, people living longer, fewer caregivers to take care of them, we're in trouble, especially with the fact that two out of every seven of us will have a neurodegenerative disease by the time we get to our 80s and 90s. If we don't do something, it's gonna be very expensive for our country and be problematic in general. Uh, in my opinion, the only way out of this box is transforming healthcare with technology. Per, uh, excitingly, though, there is a big revolution going on in digital healthcare with more sensors being developed, uh, moving from the hospital and the clinic being the point of care to being where the patient is located being the point of care, um, leveraging what goes on with the internet and all the information that's embedded there. Medicine is being transformed from something that's uh, uh, analog and subjective into something that is um, digital, objective, and based on where the patient is located and where the point of care can be any place in the world. Uh, every medical device is being transformed from an analog device into a digital device. And hand in hand with that, we're leveraging what's going on with the consumer uh, movement to measure what's going on. Uh, the quantified self movement people are capturing data about their lifestyle, their nutrition, uh, their exercise. This data is being posted and shared, um, and we are able to drive a lot of information from it. This allows us, um, and the companies that are involved in developing digital healthcare applications, uh, an extremely valuable resource in terms of collecting information, coming up with back-end analytics to come up with personalized medicine, pushing that information to the clinicians to help come up with better protocols and uh, recommended guidelines. And using cell phones, the internet, uh, uh, computers, and virtual reality systems as a point of care to deliver interventions and cycle back the information from those interventions to refine and come up with population trends. So there's a huge um, breakthrough going on in terms of deep learning, machine learning, um, deep analytics to interpret this data and come up with better interventions. So we're soon at a spot where we will have a huge amount of information that will help us refine the protocols and interventions that we do. And this will be particularly in, in, useful in behavioral health care where so much of what we've been dealing with has been subjective self-report data. We will now have data about behavior and the context of that behavior. As part of this revolution, um, virtual reality is gonna play a big role. And I'll give you some examples why. Um, let me pause for a second and ask, how many of you have had a chance to try a virtual reality system? Wow, I, that's probably 90% of the people here. Um, of that group, how many of you have had a chance to try a good virtual reality system? I, I mean one that's not a cell phone based one, but one that's hooked into a computer that has great graphics. Okay, that's a pretty healthy population too. I think if I had asked that question two years ago, um, very few people would have raised their hand. Um, it's coming at us really fast. I've spent a lot of time this summer traveling throughout the world, in particular in China, where billions of dollars are being spent um, on building the infrastructure and pushing it out to people in the equivalent of internet cafes. And when we look at what's coming to here in the US, it's just incredible what will be here in a few years. We have some time to prepare for it and how it will impact what we're doing as clinicians and research scientists, but it is coming pretty fast. One of the th challenges that's going on right now for the consumer electronics companies that have spent so much money developing VR systems is that entertainment and gaming is not gonna be enough 
to justify the now almost $4 billion that Oculus has spent on its VR systems, the billions of dollars that uh, Microsoft, App, uh, Apple, Samsung, um, Huawei, HTC, uh, Sony, all the major consumer electronics companies and many of the uh, infrastructure companies behind them have spent, we have to move this technology and push it over to the enterprise. And medicine will be one of the big verticals for that. And I'll give you some examples why. So here's sort of my summary slide. I'll give it to you now. Um, the good news is that we've had virtual reality technology going back almost three decades in the research laboratories. And as a result, we have a good sense of what protocols work, uh, what doesn't work, what the blind alleys are. We've been waiting for the technology to become comfortable and affordable. That's happening right now. It will be even more comfortable, even more affordable very soon. And we're poised to take the learnings that we've had from the last three decades of research and migrate them out to interventions in behavioral health care and other aspects of medicine. It's really the full stack of medicine that's going to be affected by this emerging technology. Um, starting with wellness and prevention, improved assessments, improved interventions, systems that will facilitate adherence, and pushing uh, care delivery out from the clinic to where the individual is. So again, for me, this has been a personal journey. I first got involved back in 1984, decades ago. And we had VR systems back then, but they were very expensive and uncomfortable. Um, we had computers that were the size of a small refrigerator, and the head-mounted displays that we used uh, were incredibly uncomfortable, and we had to counterbalance them sometimes with a brick. But they worked, and we were able to do some, some basic research using them. Um, it looks silly now, but we thought we were pretty cool at the time. I tried translating some of the work that we had done previously out to help with um, um, the problem of post-traumatic stress, post-earthquake in Sichuan, China, after the, the huge earthquake they had and with 50,000 people suffering signs of post-traumatic stress. It was impossible at the time. The, the technology was too expensive and not robust enough. I believe today, if there was a disaster of similar magnitude, we would be able to take cell phone technology that people have and go in and use it as a, a way of help um, teaching relaxation skills and dealing with some of the anxiety and symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So a lot has happened since that point uh, where I tried to see if we could migrate it out before. Again, I think now is the time. Uh, I, I like to say we're sort of at the 300 baud modem stage, uh, the early stage of this technology where we can see what can happen, but it's going to get much better very soon. Every major technology company is spending huge amounts of money betting on virtual reality technology as being the next computer platform, the next human interaction platform, the, the way that we're going to work, the way we're going to play, the way we're going to communicate with each other. And they're continuing to invest uh, heavily in this arena, and, and not just in the hardware, the head-mount displays and the motion uh, measurement systems, but also the software and enabling uh, toolkits behind it. And by the way, when I talk about VR technology, I use it sort of a shorthand for all aspects of uh, immersive technology, AR, mixed reality. There's a whole spectrum of uh, terminology, and to me, it's just a spectrum of immersion. Um, you can have something that's fully immersive with a uh, head-mounted display that blocks out the outside world, but we can also overlay the world with uh, augmented reality. And sometimes you don't have to wear anything. We have rooms that you can step into and interact with, and uh, we're building a few of these in some senior care facilities to help pe connect uh, individuals with their family and friends and promote exercise and uh, um, reduce isolation and loneliness. As I mentioned before, it's not just the hardware. There are thousands of software companies and technology companies jumping in, investing heavily in developing the enabling software that will go with this very amazing um, display hardware. Uh, this is a conservative estimate that was made a few years ago and that we've already surpassed what it is. Um, the projections at the time were that within three years, will be, VR will likely be adopted by 30 million users. The current projections are almost twice that. So it's coming at us really fast. And 
it's not just the uh, technology companies that are paying attention, the investment community is too. Uh, several companies um, have received significant investments and are focusing on VR technology. Um, MindMaze, for example, has raised $100 million, I think actually about $120 million now, at a $1 billion valuation. Quite amazing to focus on what they call NeuroVR. Reflection Health is working on um, rehabilitation using semi-immersive VR. Uh, Limbix is focusing on treating post-traumatic stress using virtual reality technology, and they're also looking at addictions. And Paratherapeutics is looking at post-traumatic stress in combination of therapy with pharmaceuticals. I've recently talked and checked in with 72 companies that are involved in this area. Um, and there's right now 18 clinical sectors and it's growing, uh, ranging from stress management to cognitive rehabilitation to disability solutions to mood disorders, senior care, autism spectrum disorders, pain management, a large list of interventions. And you'll notice that many of the categories here that I've listed out are in the zone of mental health care. So again, uh, this lurch forward that's been enabled by um, the technology has the underpinnings of a lot of research that's been done. Now, granted, many of the early research, because of the cost of the equipment, was done on small uh, sample sizes. Uh, I, I would say that there's not a single study that has really robust enough to justify being called a clinical trial per se. I would say they're almost all pilot studies. But they're pilot studies that have showed us the pathways, has given us indications of what works, what doesn't work, what, what, what is useful for a clinician, what's useful for a patient. And now we're poised, now that technology has become affordable, to go out and redo these trials with the current technology. So again, we have more than 30 years of academic research uh, demonstrating um, the value of some of this technology. It's been too bulky, too expensive, too uncomfortable to use. But now, I think we're ready to get out there and, and have it in use. And people are using it clinically right now. And for example, we've been, we have maybe 90 systems of back and virtual Afghanistan out in the VA hospital network being used to treat post-traumatic stress in that population. So it is the full stack of medicine that's being affected by this. I'll give examples from each category. Starting with medical training, uh, VR lends itself to uh, clinical training because we, mistakes are free. We can come up with a clinical situation, we can come up with extreme situations that a clinician may never normally encounter, and we can have a patient practice in a very ecologically correct, very realistic uh, way. And uh, there's, these are just a few examples, uh, ranging from surgical skill training to how to use a particular type of equipment and tools to working as a team, uh, how to deal with an emergency response, uh, uh, there's whole cities have used virtual environments as a way to practice response to a simulated dirty bomb explosion, for example. And interestingly enough, there are some groups that are using VR to help, um, through a third-person perspective, teach empathy. We've always had, well, we've had for a long time technology to do surgical training uh, through simulators, but they've been very expensive. People would fly into regional centers because the equipment is too, ex was too expensive to have at a local level and work on these very amazing simulators that we didn't call it virtual reality. I think there was at the time a bit of an allergy to that term. Uh, now people feel more comfortable. We called it surgical simulation as opposed to surgical virtual reality. But we're now moving that technology from the expensive simulation centers out to the local um, uh, clinics so people can practice, get more familiar with the tool just before an operation or be using it for pre-surgical planning. Uh, here's just a very brief video of an example of how someone can practice and rehearse using um, uh, a, placing a tibial nail. Um, maybe they haven't used that particular kit for um, doing that surgical procedure for a while. At the spot and just prior to the uh, procedure, they can rehearse and make sure they have the sequencing right. I think there's some audio on this one. It's okay if it doesn't come up though. So you see him practicing the sequencing. Um, there's a context for him that makes it look like he's in the operating room, and he's using the motion controllers to learn the positioning and the sequencing on how to use that particular uh, surgical device. Uh, 
here's another example of a, and this one, the graphics are a little bit old, this is about six years old, but using VR uh, to help um, uh, a team of nurses practice pr uh, preparing a uh, patient for a dialysis procedure. Uh, you notice that there's a little bit of uh, gamification elements of this where you know, there's rewards for doing the, the process correct, but you have to do the right sequence, et cetera. And this is a multi-user virtual environment, so uh, teams can practice together to get the procedure right. And again, instead of subjective re recording uh, the experience, we get objective data about sequencing, timing, uh, how smoothly they do the procedure, whether they make mistakes, and the, the trainee can practice offline at their own pace. Here's just one more example of using VR for training for an emergency department. How would you like me to proceed? Choose a location for the chest drain insertion site. So it's not just um, learning the what happens next and how to do it. We also have multi-user environments so people can practice working as a team to solve a problem. We also are using VR environments for pre-surgical planning and uh, image-guided surgery. I'm going to switch now. To, I'm going to pick up the pace a bit because of time constraints. Uh, there's a whole range of diagnostic assessments that are being enabled by uh, VR technology, and in particular in our field of um, behavioral medicine, it's going to make a big difference. We can move from the subjective um, uh, self-report or observational um, things to actually measuring behavior in a virtual environment. Um, there's a whole example, a list of examples of how we're doing it currently, ranging from um, neuropsychological assessments to activities of daily living, um, to better measurements for physical medicine, et cetera. And again, we don't always have to use a head-mounted display for that. We have uh, room-based environments that allow people to capture a variety of uh, interactions in a multi-user way in an environment that gives the ecological contrast text for the behavior. Um, in addition to the improved assessments, we also have improved interventions that are out in use clinically. Um, uh, stroke rehabilitation, optical rehabilitation, distractions for acute and chronic pain, systems to promote uh, better weight management. Interventions in behavioral health include um, um, teaching situational confidence and refusal skills for um, substance of abuse, um, helping people with schizophrenia, um, post-traumatic stress, anxiety disorders, cognitive impairment, autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder, the list goes on. Um, if you don't say your favorite indication here, it's just because I didn't have room on the slide. There's been a tremendous amount of work uh, in almost all aspects of uh, behavioral medicine. And again, uh, it's not always the clinical issue. We have used very successfully virtual environments to promote uh, health and wellness, uh, um, teach, teaching people resilience and stress management, uh, um, teaching grief counseling and uh, providing um, uh, skill training for cognitive function, uh, post-traumatic uh, injury, uh, promoting exercise and weight management. And one thing to emphasize again is because we can do VR on a portable system, it allows us to be a telemedicine system. Now, not always appropriate, for example, dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress, you would want to do that in a co-located manner. But for other interventions, like helping someone who has a fear of public speaking, that can be done in a distributed manner. And it's not just the VR technology that's contributing to this revolution. We also, our friends over in the AI community are developing great AI systems to allow us to have simulated pa uh, patients. This is just a very brief video that's been used. Um, it will show you an AI system in the form of a clinician who is interviewing the patient. And we're capturing uh, facial expression, voice tone, and body language to help inform the questions that the virtual clinician is asking of the patient. This is the work from uh, Skip Rizzo's lab at uh, USC. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. 
And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Now, oh. you can imagine how a system like this could be used for training, but it can also be used for pre-screening or to reach um, people who otherwise might be on a waiting list to help provide some uh, information and support. It's been used, uh, this was a DARPA-funded project, so it's been used to uh, help provide support to um, um, vets who are hesitant to come in for therapy and don't want to talk uh, to a therapist directly but need information. Uh, studies indicate that people reveal a lot more to a AI system that is acting like a therapist than they do to an actual therapist, which, which is interesting in itself. So there's been a lot of breakthroughs in, in the whole AI arena that are mapping well to the virtual reality arena. We'll have lots of options with virtual patients to train on and, and perhaps to use as uh, a way of reaching patients when we're offline. Let's see, I don't think I have time for this one, unfortunately. It's a fantastic AR system where you speak into a microphone, you take a picture of yourself, it gets mapped to an avatar, and then that avatar can speak with your mannerisms and your tone of voice, but in another language, it can sing and it can dance, even if you can't sing and dance. It's really incredible what we can do with AI technology now. So let me just quickly go through some examples of how VR is being used clinically right now. Uh, a lot of work on treating phobias, uh, fear of heights, fear of flying, um, for exposure therapy. Uh, again, it's just a basic exposure therapy system, but it's augmented by being able to block out the outside world and take the patient in a graduated way to address their, um, their triggers and issues. We also have using VR as a better way of doing some cognitive assessments. Uh, Here's a system that's a, a virtual The virtual high school classroom environment. attention evaluation system consists of a virtual classroom environment and utilizes the standard continuous performance test with multimodal distractions, as well as motion detection of the head, arm, and leg. There's a strong AI system behind this collecting the data for refining the assessments. We've also used VR to help with um, alcohol and substance of abuse issues, uh, teaching refusal skills and situational confidence. We've used VR for stress inoculation, preparing people who are likely to have a stressful experience like first responders to be prepared and work on their resilience skills. Uh, one project I'm particularly proud of is a project we're currently doing at Stanford University. It's called Project Braveheart, where we've done stress inoculation for children who are scheduled for cardiac surgery. In this case, we know weeks in advance what the worst day of their life is going to be. And what we've developed is a 360 video, and 360 video is very easy to do. It's, it uh, can be done very inexpensively and cheaply. And we've green screened in kids who've had the procedure before to serve as guides. So the family members and the children who are um, scheduled for surgery can walk through the hospital, learn what's gonna happen to them, have a guide show them the way, and we also teach them relaxation skills uh, as part of the system. We give this to them weeks in advance before their surgery so they can be prepared psychologically. Braveheart is an interactive VR experience developed to reduce stress levels in children who will be undergoing a surgical procedure. Patients and their families are guided through a 360 degree video tour of the hospital by a virtual companion. The gender-specific tour guide provides a friendly, approachable, and relaxing tour of the facility and introductions to doctors and key hospital staff. Along the hospital tour, patients visit the key rooms they'll encounter on the day of their procedure to help make... I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll skip through that, but we're in the process of collecting um, uh, cortisol levels and other uh, objective measurements of stress and comparing it with um, control group to see the efficacy of the virtual reality stress inoculation. So, and again, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of my talk, I'm particularly concerned about the aging crisis we have, and uh, many of the things that we've been able to do with VR map very well to address the issues that our aging seniors face, such as chronic pain, um, isolation and loneliness, uh, stroke rehabilitation, um, 
and also training staff, not just procedures, but also to have empathy. Uh, one of the other major areas that VR has been successfully used in is helping with uh, pain distraction. Um, this has been validated with um, fMRI to understand what changes with the application of this. It's not just a distraction. It actually can be used to uh, modify how people respond to pain. And I, I th I'm going to have to skip this video too, but uh, this just shows quickly the uh, use of uh, VR as a pain distractor for a child who otherwise would not let us uh, tend his wound without uh, uh, a huge amount of anesthesia. Once we taught him how to use the VR system as a distractor, we were able to um, address his wound without using any uh, anesthesia at all. I'll have to skip through that, I'm afraid. We've used VR uh, to help train people for critical discussions and delivering bad news for a patient. Uh, sort of, you can go down one pathway, the patient gets angry. You go down another pathway, the patient withdraws and gets very sad. It's uh, great for training purposes. And again, the VR creates the context, makes it more engaging for the patient. I'm so sorry I'm running out of time here uh, because this is the part that's my favorite part, talking about why VR is so engaging. Uh, the short answer is that it's because we block out the rest of the world, because it's, uh, it's, we can activate um, in a very realistic way an emotional response from, from the um, user, it gives us the ability to teach people how to manage that emotional response. It's really pretty profound. Um, in our lab, we have a demo where people walk a plank over a high area, and even though they know that they're in our lab and they're talking with their friends, 30% of the people that we bring into our lab can't walk across that plank because it's too scary. So it's an example of how we can activate a cognitive response, teach people the coping skills to deal with it. One of the things that we do is we can also age progress uh, a person. This is, can be used to help um, uh, motivate people to take care of their future self. Uh, it's actually uh, been very effective, and, and we find if we show Stanford undergraduates a picture of their future self, it's very motivating for them to put aside money for retirement or to uh, change their lifestyle habits. And, and this is, we've done follow-up studies on this, and, it, and the phenomenon persists even months later. And we're doing some work right now on using NEARS technology as part of an intervention combined with virtual reality technology for attention deficit disorder. Okay, I, I'm so sorry that I've had to rush through this. Um, there's a lot going on. I hope I've given you a feel for it. Uh, we're hosting a conference in a month at Stanford specific to virtual reality and mental health care. I hope you can make it. I have uh, some invitations to the conference up here. If this has sparked your interest, please come and join us uh, next month. Okay, that's my talk.